Great. Um, welcome everyone to our webinar on improved prescribing through education and reporting. Um, uh, actually, I'm going to wait a second. Oh, here we go. Um, mute. Here we go. Um, so welcome everyone to our webinar on improved prescribing through education and reporting. I'm Ellen Andrews from the Connecticut Health Policy Project. We are a state-based consumer advocacy organization focused on improving the quality and affordability of healthcare in our state. Today's webinar hits both those goals. We are fortunate to hear from Greg Lowe about how he and his team at Mass General are improving prescribing by giving providers information and tools. They've honed these tools over years to build on what works and we'll think about how we can um, use those tools and learning to benefit Connecticut's healthcare system. Uh, Greg recently transitioned to a new position as the manager for pharmacy operations at Mass General Brigham Health Plan. For the previous 16 years, he was the director for Mass General's Physicians Organizations Pharmacy Quality and Utilization Program at Mass General Hospital in Boston. I can imagine how big your business cards had to be for that. Right? <laughs> Um, at the Physicians Organization, he worked with clinical leadership to develop, implement, and evaluate ambulatory pharmacy programs. His efforts addressed pharmacies' contribution to total medical expense, physician variation reporting, ACO reporting, and academic detailing. During his tenure, the organization substantially improved their quality and efficiency metrics. Greg received his BS in pharmacy from the University of Rhode Island, followed by a residency in clinical informatics with Ohio Northern University and Blanchard Valley Medical Associates. And he completed his PhD in pharmacoepidemiology and pharmacoeconomics at the University of Rhode Island. Um, everyone should feel free to type their questions into the Q&A box during the webinar. And thank you, Greg, for sharing your insights today. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Um, we we love to share what we've worked on. Um, by all means, um, feel free to type in the chat uh, throughout and interrupt just um, in case I forget to define an acronym, anything like that. Um, let me know and hopefully we'll have time to discuss at the end. And so I'm going to go a little quickly here to try to get through quite a bit. So as Ellen mentioned, I'm currently employed by the health plan. Um, I divested of some stock within the last 12 months, but it's there for transparency, no additional disclosures. Um, I'm here speaking in my own capacity, um, not representing Mass General Hospital or the health plan at this time. Um, I know best practice for CE, we try to avoid brand and proprietary names. Uh, in this respect, I did use a couple just because they're reports of what brands you're using. So obviously we have to use brand names as examples, but otherwise avoided them as best I could. So um, as Ellen mentioned, I was the director of the Mass General Physicians Organization's Quality uh, and Utilization Program. Um, and uh, this talk was based on a talk given at the Academy of Managed Care Pharmacy. So there's uh, quite a bit of overlap between the two. Let me dive right in and get to what the Mass General Physicians Organization. So that was um, a physicians organization related to Mass General Hospital, was and still is, and had a number of pay for performance contracts with the local payers. Um, I know when we do kind of national comparisons, we see that New England tends to be well ahead of the rest of the country in commercial risk contracts. So I don't know specifically how Connecticut worked out, but in mass, we had commercial risk contracts well before the federal government got involved in risk contracts. Um, so this history goes back at least till 2005. Um, if you're interested, um, Massachusetts Blue Cross Blue Shield has a lot of documentation out on their alternative quality contract out there. Um, we also had populations with Blue Cross, Harvard, Tufts, uh, then eventually Medicare got in the game. Uh, we were a pioneer ACO and have transitioned to other risk contracts with Medicare. And we also have a Medicaid population that's under risk. So there's some sort of incentive to limit the growth in trend. Um, and that risk is borne at the top level by the institution. 
So as opposed to the 90s, where we had HMOs putting heavy, heavy risk on individual primary care do doctors, this is top level risk. So it's risk for the organization. Uh, lastly, there we have our own employees, which were self-funded plans. So managing those costs is all, all, was always a priority for us as well. So specific to pharmacy, what did these pay for performance contracts look like? Well, we generally had a percent generic measure. Um, so that would just be the ratio of how, how much of your prescribing is generic or your fills are generic relative to all fills. So the the brands and generics would be in the denominator. We also had a pharmacy cost measure. So how well are we doing with the rate of increase? Now that would be benchmarked to the other providers in the state. So these targets would recognize that new drugs would come to market and things like that. But the question was relative to other providers, how good a job at you, are you doing at reducing pharmacy costs? And then lastly, pharmacy is just a huge component of so many of the quality goals that we had. So hemoglobin A1C targets, you know, it's partly about the infrastructure of bringing your diabetics in, but some of it is managing the medication, making sure patients are adhering, all those sorts of pieces. So there were a lot of pharmacy measures in the pay for performance measures, and we needed to develop strategies of how are we going to hit those targets. Um, so we had a huge number of improvement efforts. There was a transition over the years between which efforts we prioritized. Academic detailing was our first effort and went throughout. So this really started in 2007 for us. If you're not familiar with academic detailing, the idea being that drug detailing, the brand manufacturers are always trying to get into our docs and tell them all the reasons they should use new expensive brand name drugs. In academic or counter detailing, um, our idea is we want to give the physicians an unbiased view of new drugs and where they fit with, with traditional drugs. We don't want to say never use this new agent, but often the new agents are really third line, second line agents. And we want to frame appropriately, here's the patient that's appropriate for the new drug, and here's the ones that aren't. As part of that, um, we also tended to give our physicians a lot of information on kind of regulatory updates and things like that. That kind of gave us a little bit of a carrot and stick approach where some of our time was helping them uh, avoid administrative burden with the tips we were able to share with them. And, and you know, the stick is kind of more the, hey, stop prescribing these expensive drugs. So there, there was a little push and pull there that that uh, kept the doors open for us. Um, academic detailing has a long history, goes back to the 80s, the original research from Steve Sumerai and Jerry Avorn out of the Brigham and Harvard Medical backwards. But um, so we know academic detailing is effective uh, from the literature. Uh, we didn't spend a lot of time reproving that. Um, unlike most academic detailing, we did ours in groups. Our primary care physicians are very comfortable with each other. They are kind of the family they see every day. Uh, we don't share information unblinded between groups. So that would be talking out of school, but just sharing within a given primary care practice, they were comfortable with unblinded. You get to see what your peers are doing and they would discuss it. So the next piece we had for improvement efforts is guidelines for new drugs, tied in closely with the academic detailing, but especially with expensive new uh, specialty drugs. The question was really, you know, when is the appropriate time to use these drugs? When do you refer to a specialist? And we wanted the specialist to guide us on what the proper limits were. And then we could share those out with, with primary care through the academic detailing. So decision support, we have a lot of decision support in the electronic medical record. We are an EPIC platform. Uh, everybody's EPIC looks different. So, um, but uh, we try to make sure that a lot of this is not pop-ups, alerts. We're trying to avoid that. What we really want to do is make it easy to order the preferred thing in the first place. Uh, we do have some things like smart RXs, which rather than being a pop-up, it's something that the physician opts into during ordering if they want a little extra guidance. Um, therapeutic substitution was a big portion early on and kind of faded. Um, when I started uh, in 2007, we had a lot of patients who were on atorvastatin 10 milligram 
And they could, at, at the time, Simvastatin, the generic to Zocor, had, had recently gone generic. And because there was a large population of patients who were good candidates to switch all at once, we st set up a giant framework that the physicians would get an email listing their patients, asking if they would like a caller to present the opportunity to the patient. We followed a very tight script. If the physician agreed and the patient wanted to try it, we did all of the switching for them, handled it in the EMR, got a, a prescription from the physician, made sure that the prescription reached the pharmacy and the old one got canceled. And then we would also follow up with the physician. In the case of simvastatin, because we're really trying to manage the patient's cholesterol, we would make sure that the lab values got collected following up, that, that the patient got in to get the follow-up labs and, and that the switch was successful. Now, a lot of people do uh, utilization reports for physician feedback, and that's what I'm going to spend most of the rest of the time on, specifically because that's where we really do something different from most ACOs. Um, with traditional uh, prescription feedback reports, the, the docs get like a network target goal, and they get their own percent generic, and what do they always say? oh, my patients are sicker. Yeah, I look worse than usual, but that's just because my patients are different. The other problem we have is half of your docs are worse than average. But a lot of those docs are actually clustered near the average, and there really isn't a signal for them. But I, I had one, you know, my docs were Harvard Medical School grads, and they got very upset if anything implied they were anything less than perfect. And one of them came to say, Greg, I look bad. What's going on? And I said, you're 0.1% different from the average. I, I don't think we, you're fine. It's okay. So how could we get these reports, these feedback reports to be more useful? Um, so in general, what are feedback reports for? So um, this is kind of, I believe this is an ARC definition. Um, so I want to point out that there's multiple goals you could have in giving feedback. So we have some reports that are about ensuring minimum standards, right? So are you meeting the minimums that you're allowed to practice in our institution? So those would be our ongoing professional practice evaluation, OPPE standards. So yeah, we have measures for that. So that's one piece. Another piece is we had a quality improvement program where our physicians at the department level had to identify an improvement goal, something they were going to work on twice a year. They had to pick a new target each time. It had to improve. There was a small pot of money that they got for meeting that target. Um, that was a very different thing than a minimum, right? This was high stakes. There's money on the line. Um, so quality improvement um, can be useful. There's this external performance targets, right? So we are in pay for performance targets. As much as that's born at the institution level, we still need our docs to help us meet those measures. Um, we can't take the risk at the top level and not work uh, on those issues at the front line. So there's some measure that we're trying to use lower level measures to meet higher level measures. And the last thing is explaining variation. And that's really what we wanted to focus on. So with us, we don't know if this variation is right or wrong, but it's very strange that two physicians could practice a lifetime in exam rooms right next to each other and never know that the two are practicing totally differently. So that was really our goal is could we explain that variation? And then within, once we explain that variation, our hope was that there would be opportunities to identify best practices, more efficient practice, higher quality practices within that variation. So when I talked to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Mass, they would say, oh, we'll give you variation reporting. Oh my gosh, a nice theory, but here's the problem. My docs would get one report from Blue Cross, a separate one from Tufts, another one from Harvard. Now Tufts and Harvard have joined, but another one from Medicare and every single Part D plan, another one from Mass Health, who's our Medicaid. So one problem is they're just their inbox is overflowing and they don't end up looking at any of them. The second problem is that all of my docs have individual payer level reporting, none of them will be significant because none of them have the population size to actually do a proper analysis for trends. 
So they're either not going to be statistically significant or they're just going to be noisy all over the place. So doing payer level reporting is really not very helpful. Um, another thing we find is that these peer compet comparators are really essential. Um, you really have to know who's a similar doc, who should you be benchmarking against. We found that was a major challenge just within our own system to figure out who did the docs see as a peer that when we gave them a report, they'd say, yeah, you compared me to the right people, that's fair. That was a lot of work. Um, you know, the docs do trust the internal reports more than the external reports. Um, with us, they have a chance to give feedback. They they send us mean emails, it's fine. That's that's what we were there for. It, it really, the fact that they could see that we were responsive and if they disagreed with the way we did a measure, we could at least explain why we did it the way we did. Um, that was pretty valuable. And you know, this last thing here, that if the ACO is gonna take risk, they should be responsible for doing the management. So this is part of what I think we were taking on with ACO risk. So, with feedback reports, there's different types of outcomes. And I think I, we wanted to be really careful that not every outcome that we were interested in was going to be statistically valid. So what is useful when you're starting to say, we want to st statistically adjust these reports? So generic rate works really well because every prescription that gets filled for a doctor, you can figure out, did it come out as a generic or a brand medication? So you've got a nice large sample size. Um, now we did have some debates about, are there drugs that you wanna take out because they can't be generic? So like insulin, uh, diabetic test strips we pulled out, we pulled out insulins at the time, none of them were flagged as generic. So uh, there's some editorializing there that we did to make the measures work better. But um, you know, it was a pretty good measure because you got large data sets. Both generic rate and cost are really frustrating that they don't have these pretty normal distributions. So the, the statistics can get a little nasty, um, but but they're you can deal with them. The next things I have here are opioid measures. So when we started giving our physicians reports on their opioid prescribing, we had two issues. One is that these were just so sensitive. Um, you know, the shock to a doctor hearing that they're the highest prescriber in their group. Uh, you know, you hope they know why, right? Um, but it, it's really a, a touchy subject. Often what we found is the people who were higher had reasons they were higher. They were treating, they were perhaps the pain expert in their practice or something like that. But it wasn't something that we wanted to throw out there without a little more care. The other thing is some of our opioid measures were things like, um, do you, uh, among your patients who are on chronic opioids, do they have agreements on file um, to set expectations? Well, th that's not something that we want you to beat the average. We want 100%, right? We want you to have an opioid agreement with every patient who's on cr chronic opioid therapy. So there we were more comfortable with, we're not just trying to measure variation. We know what the target is. We know what our goal is. We want our patients to have Narcan. We want our patients to have a sign that they've been visiting the physician regularly before the, the prescription. So some of our issues there. Now, what goes in the model? So when the physicians say, my patients are different, my patients are sicker, um, what are we able to throw in there? So we put in uh, age, sex, median income by zip code. Boy, we always wish we could get something truer than median income by zip code. It works all right. Um, you know, especially in Massachusetts, we find there are some pretty extreme outliers where uh, probably if you have the biggest house in Brockton, Mass, you're still probably, um, you know, it still probably says something there, uh, Brockton being one of our poorer communities, if you don't know, Old Mill Town. So, um, Coverage by insurer that had a huge huge effect because of course the formularies different uh, are differ the utilization management for each of the insurers differs so we found coverage actually had a lot of predictive value and was very important to have in our model um, strangely the problem list conditions so hypertension and diabetes weren't 
always predictive in the direction we thought they would be. So um, I recall hypertension specifically actually predicted generic because there's so many generic drugs for hypertension. Um, so the problem lists were actually less helpful than we thought. And then lastly, acuity scores. So there are several uh, scores just of acuity in, in general, how sick is a patient, how likely are they to incur further costs. Um, we actually ended up going with a, a homegrown with called the Lin score after Pam Linoff. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the details of that. But uh, as an academic center, we were frustrated that many of these measures like the DXCG are proprietary and the owners will not let you under the hood to understand what's really going on. They it, So we don't like black boxes. Um, but um, so these were the factors we went with. Now, when I would bring these reports out to the physicians and, and the other prescribers, uh, one of the things I would be very careful with is I would fully explain the report before I handed it out to them. The second I handed it to them, they were gone. They were lost. They were looking for their name and what their, their grade was, right? What their value was in the report. So we always sat down and said, all right, let me explain what you're going to see. So the observed value is the real value. So it is your true percent generic. It is your true uh, co average cost of, of prescription that your patient filled. There's no adjustment to the observed value. That, that is what it is. The adjustment comes into this expected value. So the expected is going to be a, a modeled comparison that's going to differ for every single prescriber. Then we would put a confidence inter interval around the expected value. And the great thing is now what we're saying is, given what we know about your patients compared to your peers, here's what we expect your generic rate is going to be. If you're within that confidence interval, you're fine, you're average. You can still look at the report if you want, but we don't have any reason to think that there's a message there for you. If you're a statistically significant outlier, either high or low, there's a story, there's something we wanna understand. So that's what we're starting with. So I'm not gonna, you know, we're not gonna put up a poll, but I always think it's funny. Like, do you think when you're driving a car, are you better than average, average, or worse than average? I had always heard that a disproportionate number of people say they're better than average, but I actually, when I gave this presentation previously, I actually got a normal distribution. I was really amazed, but maybe people knew what I was getting at. So, all right, so what does different mean? We were all always very careful to say, we don't know from the get-go that statistically significantly high means you're bad. We don't know that, right? We then want to do drill downs and dig into understand why are you different? What made you different? Um, it doesn't tell us whether it's appropriate or inappropriate. We always had this theory that what if higher prescribing actually save money somewhere else? We never were able to get very far in, in modeling and explaining that, but that was always one of our kind of theories that, that we... Uh, wanted to dig into. Now, there are unmeasured factors that can throw things off. We, I had one physician who was marked as high, and the problem was he had a husband and wife who both refused to take generic anything, and they had brand names that I had not seen in 10 years or more. Um, so, you know, sometimes there are just patient factors and, and had nothing to do with variation between the prescribers. Another thing we find is there's a lot of variation in our system about who has supporting NPs and PAs. And it is not cleanly related to their clinical volume. And so sometimes what would happen is a PA would prescribe on behalf of a physician, and it was kind of hard to tell where the cost and the that was a bigger impact on the cost model because we had some specialists who had PA support who they were having the PA prescribe everything expensive and they themselves looked totally different. So they kind of broke our model. So something to watch out for. So now the next thing, do you want to see a clinician who's a high outlier average or a low outlier? 
I don't know. I mean, it, this was kind of a puzzle, right? You want early access to to cutting edge drugs if they're going to be beneficial to you, but gee, I don't want the high copays for no reason. I don't know. I think I want someone average, but um, it it's tough. Um, so now practically, what do these reports look like? One of the great things about these reports is we didn't just make a pharmacy model. This whole effort actually started with imaging uh, and the work of uh, Dr. Chris Sistrom, a radiologist. Um, and we actually went to pharmacy next. Actually, I think this is literally quite uh, across the uh, time series of, of when things came out. Um, if you notice the the green squares, the uh, green white circles, the green and white circles say we don't have enough data. So if you got a green and white circle, actually the, the next uh, slide is just a zoom in on this. So a white circle is we didn't have enough data. We're not saying anything about high, low or anything because we don't know. A green square means you're within the average. Now, our blue and purple triangles mean you're either high or low, but um, we generally didn't flag it as something we wanted you to review. If your generic rate was high, we said, eh, okay, you can look if you want to. But we flagged the people who we thought were outliers in a direction that we thought they should look at it. The nice thing about this is, say, provider three here, they look across and they say, oh, I'm average in imaging, appropriateness and utilization and generic. All I have to look at it as cost, save people time. And I think this really increased the amount that people were willing to look at our reports because they saw we weren't asking them to look at everything. We were just, and and you know, some physicians don't even have a report they need to look at, right? So um, we were trying to respect people's time. So this was our percent generic. And again, I'll zoom in here. So a primary care provider, you can see these percent generic rates are, are pretty well off the chart. Um, they, they were extremely high. This was in our later days of running the percent generic report. Um, but they would see detailed versus their peers within the same practice. And, and although it's blinded to us, again, within a practice, this would be unblinded and they would see where they were relative to each other. Um, and then they could drill down. And so th these were presented in a business intelligence format where it was provided securely, electronically, regularly, and they could click if they were flagged, what are the drugs that are making me show up as having a high brand use rate? And then this is the cost variation. And then this is the drill down of what the, the cost looked like. And they were able to drill down to both the individual drugs and the individual patients. So they could see, is it dr a drug that's driving my utilization or a specific patient? So we tried delivering these two different ways. Um, we did try integrating these as part of our academic detailing. So since we were seeing them regularly anyways, we would bring the reports with us. The most fun thing about that is, um, like I mentioned, I would give them the background. Here's what you're going to see. And then I, I would hand out the reports. And the first time I brought the percent generic report around, one of the docs said, you know, Greg, I, I really do value generics and my patients appreciate the cheaper copay. So for all new starts, I always use generics. But, you know, when a new generic becomes available and my patient's stable on a different therapy, I just keep going on the brand. I don't have time in a 15-minute visit to, to switch people over. And I'm, I'm getting ready to reply. And one of the physicians down the table says, you know what? I hear you, but, but let me share with you. My patients are so thankful when I change them over to an alternate generic that's going to save them money. They're so thankful that that's like what I remember when I leave the visit is how happy they were. So it's hard to find time, but I think it's worth it. And I was thrilled because I said, wow, I didn't have to get involved. Um, so there's a really great angle to doing these in person, unblinded, letting the physicians talk with each other and, and um you know, it, it's really neat that way. And often they have a lot of insight into why they're different. It's fun in the room to see where did they say, oh yeah, I knew I'd be an outlier like that. And where did they say, oh, I don't know. What, how, why is that? Um, now we transitioned over time to a virtual delivery. Um, 
the advantage of that is it was faster. Um, in the in-person delivery, these reports are relying on lag, uh, lagged claims data to start with. It takes time to generate the report. And then when's the next time I see the docs? It can often be a couple of months. So now you're talking about five month lagged information. Once we shifted to the virtual delivery, uh, we lost some of that discussion, but it was really great that they were getting it very fast, right when it's available, hot off the presses, they get an email. So how comfortable would you be if all your performance metrics were transparent to your peers? I, I, it amazed me how comfortable the physicians were within their groups. Now, do these feedback reports work? Um, there is some evidence that they do. Um, I apologize that I, since I'm not at Mass General Hospital anymore, I can't show you kind of our data on like what did our generic use rates and all those. Those things weren't you know publicly facing anyways. There is some good evidence that that the utilization reports work. That second entry there. Um, so Dr. Jeff Weilberg is a um, psychiatrist who led our variation group as a whole, um, and he was the one who brought in uh, Dr. Chris Sistrom for radiology, and then um, that was the medical director I was reporting to. So we did have some evidence that it was working. Um, I think the tough thing, though, is it's really hard to tell. There's so much that's changing over time, new drug launches. Uh, what does your baseline look like relative to the other health systems in your area? There's so much going on that it's very difficult to really assess the feedback reports fairly. Um, so, and then the last thing I have here is the durability of the effect. I think we saw, you know, most of it was anecdotal, but there were a lot of stories early on of, hey, this is great. I learned that, you know, I was uh, stumbling into some of the expensive brand metformin, say, Fortimet. And due to these reports, I identified the patients who didn't need to be on spending $6,000 for no reason. So here we go. We're going to, you know, switch that out. And the next time I saw that physician, they said, hey, Greg, I took care of it. And now my report looks great. However, most of those big stories came from the first, second, third time we ran the report. By the fourth time, the fifth time, did we really have a lot of exciting stories? It got less and less. We kept running the reports because they were built. It's easy to hit run a second time once you've built these things. I'll get to how expensive they are to build in a minute. But we don't know long term if they keep working. So challenges. Attribution is really challenging. Um, our primary care doctors vary widely in if a specialist starts a new drug, will the primary care doctor take over on renewals or will they say, you know, that's that's really managed by your specialist. You need to go back to them for that. If we had a primary care doctor who was really comfortable taking over specialist prescription renewals, then they would look very different than their peers who didn't. And that was really hard to control for. Um, we had one PCP who was an absolute standout on cost because they had one patient who had an orphan drug condition that they had researched incredibly well, and they were comfortable prescribing it, but they were the only PCP in our entire network who was using a $40,000 a year drug. And everybody was comfortable with the situation. The specialists were adequately involved. There was no reason to change practice, but it meant that this person's pharmacy cost report would every time show them as a high outlier and that was okay. Peer comparisons are really hard. So who is the peer for a pediatric endocrine specialist? Are they compared to pediatricians or endocrine or to pediatric specialists more generally? I can tell you if I only compare them to pediatric endocrine specialists, then I'm comparing two people to each other. There's just no, uh, no real story. You just can't make a statistical significance when you've got that few observations. So it's, it's really a struggle. Same thing with specialty and biologics. They're really driving our trend now. And I, I understand that I, you know, there's a bit to this whole presentation that it works so much better for small molecules. And yet now we see more and more specialty and biologic is driving trend. Um, that said, there's still some opportunity on the table, but specialty and biologics just don't have the order frequency to do statistical testing this way. 
Um, and lastly here, the ACO, we don't manage rebates. We don't manage uh, unit cost. We only could manage utilization. So that, that was always a challenge for us. I mentioned early that nor non-normal distributions are frustrating. Uh, we got a lot of questions of, should we have short evaluation periods? Well, if you make the evaluation periods short, you don't have statistical significance because your sample sizes are too small. If you have long evaluation periods, then it feels like, oh, I got a speeding ticket, but it was from last July. I don't know if I was speeding or not, right? It's very frustrating. And it's also really hard to improve your performance if the measures are so slow that you don't see them move. There's no right answer. We came up with every six months, and that was just kind of the Goldilocks answer of it was timely enough to be useful and fast enough that it moved a little bit. But there's no there's no good answer there. Um, and then the, the same thing with the reporting frequency. It's very similarly related. It's just Goldilocks seems to be the right answer. Um, now, percent generic did reach asymptotic performance. It just, it was hitting the ceiling where there were just very, very few brands left. Um, I, I think that was probably good. We still did every now and then spot breakouts of early use of third line agents and, and it was helpful, but it kind of became more of a surveillance tool than an improvement tool over time. Um, how do you ensure the reports are used? So um, I mentioned we had a quality improvement uh, program. We did have one term of that program where opening your quality improvement, uh, your, your uh, feedback report was part of the incentive. So it was one of the things you had to do to get your quality improvement um, done. Integrating it into academic detailing, even when we moved it to the uh, virtual provisioning, I would still look at the feedback report before I went out to a given practice and and I would note who was high and what did they have to work on so that at least while I'm there, I could have a discussion. Of course, all that was pre-COVID. Now that detailing is, is virtual, uh, hopefully that will someday end and we'll go back to in-person. It's hard to have those little sideline one-offs that were so valuable if you're doing everything virtually. Um, and then multi-target reports. Like I said, I think we got a lot of value from here's four topics at once. How expensive are these reports? I, to be honest, they're very expensive. You, you really need an incredible amount of expertise. Now, this was nobody's day job, uh, first job, right? Everybody was doing something else and they were kind of roped in to do this as well. Um, we were very lucky to have a, a very high quality statistician, data analyst, um, those people, again, were doing other things first, and we pulled them into this as needed. Um, we needed a lot of clinical input for design. Um, we wanted the physicians to own the reports so that they wouldn't push back on them later. Uh, the business intelligence piece, uh, making sure that design worked for, our, for the people who were going to get it was very important. So... I, this is not cheap. I think the the real question is how many physicians are you covering with a given report, right? If if you're spreading it over, we had uh, over 2,000 physicians, it's a little more reasonable to say this is an investment that's being spread around. Looking ahead, um, most of our reports are claim-based, and, and there's some real value in that and that the claims are real things that happen, but I mentioned there's a claims lag. We eventually wanted to transition to using the electronic medical record as our kind of source of truth and building measures on that. Um, we didn't get there because um, I mentioned this shop, um, I've moved on. Uh, actually, the whole team has moved on to other places a after COVID. There was a decision to move a lot of uh, structure to the institution level. So for us, that's the Mass General Brigham Network rather than Mass General Hospital. So this is all transitioning. Uh, honestly, I don't even know how many physicians we have MGB-wide, system-wide rather than hospital-wide. So um, that's where that is going. Um, and I think we had a lot of ideas of, of what would future measures look like that we never got to. Um, so that's everything I plan to cover. Uh, glad to answer questions. Um, you know, the presentation focused on the feedback reports, but also glad to talk about academic detailing and the other stuff we did as well. Um, yes, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A. Um, in the meantime, 
I, everyone who knows me on this knows that I'll have questions for you, Greg. Um, it, it was uh, interesting when we were talking that the measures were chosen by their clinical leadership. So it wasn't something that came, you know, from an insurance company or from someone they don't know. Um, can you talk a little more about how those were developed and um, it, did they have um, information before it started to decide what, you know, well, we're doing this, let's just keep it at that. Or did they look at, you know, clinical guidelines and what's ideal? Yeah, the um, the measures were a negotiation with each group. Um, and although at the end of the day, it would be some sort of consensus of the clinical group and physician leadership at the physician's organization level agreed, okay, this is a good measure. We often had kind of the first round would often be a given clinical department saying, we want to measure this thing that we do 100% of the time. And we want that to be our our measure. And we'd say, well, no, you're already doing it 100% of the time. If if it's an improvement goal, we need something that you can actually improve. So there was a lot of pushback. I It's a little hard to generalize just because every group had their own politics and challenges. But I think once they bought in, it was kind of that thing of you needed two rounds of negotiation before the group started to go, okay, now I know what I can propose. That's a real measure that people will accept. Um, also, I was just struck when we were talking before we started about your quality improvement incentives, and that's the only thing that's actually at risk. And it was a very small number. I don't know if you want to share it on here, but um, just the motivations for providers. Uh, there's a lot of in value-based purchasing, an awful lot of um, mythology, I think, or or certainly a lot of certainty that it is all about the incentives and and tweaking those, but that um, physicians really want to do a good job and they want to do it and they care about, you know, their peers and that interaction. And so I was really struck by that. And was that a, uh, um, a conscious decision to make it a low risk or to just put a small amount on quality or how did, how did that come about? Um, so the, there's something called the MGPO quality incentive program. And that that's what was this, um, small. So it, as I recall, it was about $2,000 per physician every, uh, six months, um, you know, relative to a physician's total compensation, quite a small amount of money. It was also scaled if somebody was part-time, something like that, you know, there, there were adjustments to it. Um, but it really, the incredible weight came from, there was a report, did you pass this measure or not? Um, and so I think the kind of report card feel to it of you didn't meet a measure that your clinical group said you would meet. Um, that was the much larger impact than the monetary uh, impact of it. That's good to know, actually. That's a really good thing to know, um, you know, since the state doesn't have any money. Um, another, um, when we first talked about this back in Boston, you said that you were focusing on primary care physicians. And, I, and maybe you can describe why that is, you know, just structurally from the way uh, Mass General is is structured in your position. But also, do you think that if we, we did this with nurse practitioners and PAs, or if we did it with specialists, there would be, how would you think that it would it translate well, or does it need changing? Yeah, I think there are very different concerns between primary care and specialty. And, and I don't, um, mean to draw a distinction between NPs, PAs, and physicians. Um, it was the Mass General Physicians Organization, so there was perhaps a little structural bias there. Um, but um, in a lot of our materials, it was prescribers more generally. Um, with primary care, there are so many more instances where the physicians are stumbling into high-cost products accidentally. They don't know what something costs. They don't really want their patient to end up with a giant copay. They just don't know. And so it's very easy to educate them and just say, 
this is a situation that's causing a higher cost. There are just times where, hey, the 10 milligram, 20 milligram, and 40 milligram are cheap, but the 30 milligram is fantastically expensive for no reason, right? And and those sorts of circumstances, primary care, like you don't have to win them over. They say, great, if I can avoid the 30 milligram, I avoid the callback from the pharmacy and the angry patient and everything else. The specialists tended to be a different circumstance because usually with the specialists, we needed to go to them and say, we're on the hook for managing costs, but you know where the waste is in your area. We don't. So that kind of flipped. With primary care, a lot of the times we could find the waste and bring it to them and say, hey, would you partner with us to stamp this out? With the specialists, we needed them to say, what is a patient look like who you don't want this expense on? Who, where can we avoid costs? That makes sense. Um, and please put in questions. Oh, good, we have one. Um, do you have any data about how broadly academic detailing has been implemented in Mass Massachusetts and its impact on prescribing? Um, you know, it's not something I do... Um, like policy wise, I just I'm just not really involved in the the broad policy. There there was a special irony of the fact that um, you know Dr. Jerry Avorn is at the Brigham, and the Brigham was actually the last in our network to implement academic detailing. So um, I think it is very uneven um, where it's implemented and where it's not, and even what it looks like at each place. I would recommend if you're interested in more, Alosa Health is a nonprofit that grew out of the Brigham's work and they train people on how to do academic detailing. Um, their model is pretty different from ours. Um, they tend to spend long periods of time on clinical updates. So they might say, what's the latest in diabetes care? And we're gonna spend a half hour on just updates on diabetes care. Um, our updates tended to be much broader. We, we tended to only have 10 minutes on one specific clinical update at a time. Um, so we have done a 10 minute update on uh, PrEP for HIV. In a different session, we did a 10 minute update on smart therapy for asthma. So those would be ours, but it'd be very contained. And then the rest of the 30 to 40 minutes would be a mix of here's the new brands and what you need to watch. Here's the new generics, what you need to watch. Here's the regulatory updates. Here's how to use the EMR. We just can't get into our physicians often enough to do like short updates. So our thing is, we give them everything at once. So I'm sorry, I'm answering a lot about just academic detailing in general and not how broadly it's it's impacted. Um, I, I just don't know, unfortunately. So I'm rambling. That's great. Um, uh, Deborah Gerson once says she works in a free clinic. So balancing resource stewardship with what pharma donates, another issue in itself, since nothing is free, with our patients who often are poorly controlled DMs and balancing outcomes with cost. Providers are often quick to give these expensive donated meds. Thinking of our ways we can use our EMR to guide providers in this challenge. Um, this was interesting. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, the the um, the nudges in your EMR. Is there maybe you can talk about that? Um. Yeah. I first for samples. So we banned samples from the get-go, and that is very challenging. Um, so yes, it does mean that some of our patients who financially would benefit, um, you know, that's often off the table from the get-go. Um, to some degree, I think that is the right way to go, um, but I understand the a lot of people would differ and say, hey, if I can help one patient, I can help one patient. Um, we have a lot of trouble with patients getting started on agents they're not going to be able to afford tomorrow, right? And so, oh, great, you got them started on something, but but they can't continue due to the cost. Um, we do have um, real-time benefit check added into Epic. Um, 
So this is a, a true query of the insurance company of if I prescribe this drug, what will the patient's copay be? Um, that's been a little rockier than we hoped. First of all, it takes time for the prescriber to, to activate that. They have to train on it. And then even during an individual clinical encounter, they have to click on it and say, oh, what would this copay be? And the functionality has the ability for the insurer to say, this has a high copay, but if you prescribe this other alternative that's in the same class, it would be super cheap. And almost none of our insurance companies are, oh yeah, physician assistance program, gotcha. I mean, I, it's still in the same bucket that it's something that the patients have to bring to the providers, not something that the providers bring um, to the patients. Um, like I, I, we're not even allowed to have like vouchers in the clinics. They can have them at the pharmacy, but they can't have them in the, in the practice. A, a voucher is considered a sample. It's treated the same way. Um, yep. Herman Crank wants to, says in the Medicaid world, often a brand name product is preferred because due to rebates and supplemental rebates, which you touched on the brand actually costs less than the generic to the state and skews the generic utilization rate. Was this considered in the overall process? Yeah, um, so mass health is just like a, a huge problem for us overall because they do have this brand preferred over generic list. It's it's um, if you want to see mass health list, it's quite long on their website. And um, all, all I can say is basically we kind of have ha um, cordoned off mass health and treated them as a separate population um, for those purposes for that exact reason because. Clearly, they are not paying what comes across on the claim level. We've asked Mass Health if they would find some way to make the measures actually make sense. So we want to know when we're saving them money. We don't want to switch patients from uh, the best example that's publicly known is Mavret versus Ecluza. Uh, Mass Health has no preference between the two, which clearly means Ecluza has a large rebate and Mavret is a cheaper drug. Well, it would make our pay for performance contracts look better if we switched patients from Epclusa to Mavret because the claim cost would go down. We refuse to do it because we know that that is not actually saving the state any money and we're not going to inconvenience our patients. It just it violates our ethical principles to to inconvenience patients for no actual benefit to anyone. So um, you were talking about, um, you know, ginormous copays and how um, providers were really motivated by not using 30 milligrams because they could, um, you know, avoid that cost for their patients. Is there anywhere in, or, and is it even possible in your performance reporting that you could highlight that and say, you know, how you're doing comparison to others in terms of saving money for your patients? If that's a motivator, would that help? get them, you know, to do the, the better quality. Yeah. Some of those are large enough, like the expensive metformins were large enough that they actually showed up on the report. And so we didn't even have to do anything special. They would show up, they would make someone high and they would show up on the drill down for some of these other smaller things that, you know, maybe they're four times as expensive, but they're not enough to actually make a physician an outlier on cost those we would just have to handle as one-offs because we're talking about saving a couple thousand dollars, not tens of thousands of dollars. Um, Are you talking about the copay or the total cost of the drug? Total cost. Yeah. So, but, but in terms of the patient's um, cost, because you said you had that lookup where you can look into the insurer and say, this is what it's going to cost to you. Can you do that as a performance to sort of look at what's the best deal for the patient? Oh, we would love to. The The IT has not gotten far enough to integrate that into other things. Um, right now, we can only query that for one patient for one drug at the time that you're in the ordering screen. We want to build it so you could, yeah, exactly. Like, um, it would be great to say, when are you prescribing the preferred product? And that's my future of, we want these measures to move to the EMR and be much more advanced than they are today. But no, we we wow. didn't get close to it yet. Yeah. Um, well, great. This has been wonderful. I don't see any more questions, but if you have more questions, uh, feel free to send them to me or to Greg, his um, 
His emails are up there and the tomorrow you'll be getting an email with links to the slides and to a recording of the webinar. So I wanna thank you all for joining us and thank you very, very much, Greg. Um, we really appreciate it. I'm hoping that you started something here. Great, thanks. Thanks.